Welcome to the first event in the speaker series, The Art of Conversation. I'm Kelly Furman with the Cab Calloway School Fund, and the fund is a nonprofit uh, organization made up of parent volunteers who are working to improve access to arts education. And we support programs here at Cab Calloway School of the Arts that can't be funded by the school district alone. So thank you very much for your purchase of these tickets. Uh, this fundraiser is a collaboration with the Delaware Theatre Company, and we are fortunate tonight to have its executive director, Bud Martin, uh, lead the conversation. So Bud is a pillar in the arts community here in Delaware, and not only does he bring experience as a producer and director of theatre himself, but he's also a great businessman, and he has made the Delaware Theatre Company uh, financially stable. So, please help me welcome Bud Martin. Thank you all very much. Very happy to be here. Uh, I think this all came about because I got a call from Sally McBride and Dana Balick, and they said, could we get together with you? So they did and said they had this idea for the speaker series, and they wanted to know if I could help round up some speakers particularly Maurice Hines, because he knew Cab Calloway. So I've known Maurice for a number of years, and probably outside of his family, I may know him better than anybody, because I have produced his life at um, <laughs> Delaware Theatre Company. I've produced his life in New York. I've directed his life in Philadelphia. And um, he's one of those guys that I have just um, an, an immense amount of um, love for. He is one of the most engaging people, one of the most humbling people. I've never seen somebody stand on stage and grab an audience the way that he does. And I think one of the reasons that people respond to him the way they do is because he just loves the people that come to love him. So um, I'm Maurice did a fundraiser for us a couple of years ago with the Diva Jazz Orchestra, and he stood out on the end of our stage, and he said he would really like to bring his show, Tapping Through Life, to Delaware Theatre Company, and could the audience please try to convince me? So the audience immediately, you know, huge uproarious applause and so forth, so that um, we did the show, and um, since then we've been great friends. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Maurice Hines. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> I am so happy to be here, especially with Bud. I'm just, I'm just one of those people that love walking on the stage. It's just one of those things. And I'm just so happy to be here because I have to say this, and I'm going to say, I said it to him earlier, but I have to say this right off the bat. Um, I've, I've worked, I've been in the business a long, long time. I'm turning 75 this year, so I've been in it a long time. Looking good. <laughs> no, so, but you know, I've worked a, a, a lot of different places, and and you always find the, the people that you love the most are the people that love the business the most. There are a lot of empresarios all over the world, and I've always I've only worked with three that I could say love the business besides loving us as artists. And one was Mr. Schiffman, who ran the Apollo Theater in Harlem. The other one is Bruno Cocatrix, who, run, who ran the theater, the Olympia Theater in Paris, that Gregory and I worked uh, quite a few times. And the third one is this gentleman right here. He's really quite exceptional, <laughs> really quite exceptional. And he knows you, me, Marie. he knows me. I don't, you know, I don't jive around, baby, I'll tell you the truth. And he is very, very, I'm just so honored just to be in his presence, I really am. So I have a very quick story to tell about Maurice, and I don't know if there's anybody in the audience that was here when we did this, but when he was doing Tapping Through Life at our place, um, somebody asked me if I could, by any chance, get Maurice to agree to do a master class with um, dance students out here, which he happily agreed to do. So I was driving him out, and on the way out, he said, you know, it looks like they have this scheduled for an hour and a half. I don't know that I can 
do an hour and a half, does, do you think they would mind if I did it just a little under an hour? I said, I'm sure they'd be fine, Maurice. <laughs> two hours later, <laughs> after I had already taken two kids to the, student, uh, to the nurse's office, <laughs> <laughs> I had to remind Maurice that he still had a show to do that night, and he needed to knock it off before any more kids got hurt. <laughs> he did, he did, he did tell me that. But I, you know, because Gregory and I worked with Cab Calloway, and it was at the school, and Cab was so wonderful to Gregory and I. We were only, when we met him, we, we did a, a show called The Cotton Club in Florida. I think we were 9 and 11. So to meet a, a, a talent like that and a, and a star like that who took us under his wing and as far as learning how to perform and, and the audience. And Cab always said, the only thing that matters is the audience. You don't matter. When I, they're not interested if you're sick or nothing. You get out there and you do your show. And that was our training, that young. He, he was not the only one that said it, but when Cab said it, you, you, know, you believed him because he did it. There were a few nights that he was under the weather and he still sang, uh, hi 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 ho baby. He was singing hi ho It didn't matter. So it, it, I'm, I'm very grateful to, to be here and honored to be here in a school with his name. It's just, I can feel his presence, you know? Swinging that hair, baby, swinging that hair. <laughs> that the picture outside with him swinging, with his hair down there, oh my God, it just brought back so many memories. Because nobody could, and he was a great musician, a lot of people forget, you know, because he conducted the band and he was a great singer and a performer. But he was a great musician. He had great musicians in his band. People forget one of the first trumpet players in his band was Dizzy Gillespie. See, probably people don't know that, but he, he nurtured them. He nurtured them. I know I'm talking a lot already, so I'll, 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 calm, I'll, calm, I'll calm down. No, I didn't think I'd have to do anything except introduce Maurice. <laughs> <and then> <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, tell, tell us how you got your start. What, when you and Gregory first put your white buck shoes on and... Well, you know, what, what happened was, um, they, uh, they came around, we were living in, in Harlem on 150th Street, and they came around with free tap classes, right? And so my mother said, well, you know, uh, uh, I noticed that Maurice and Gregory, they're twirling around the house, maybe they'd like to do this. So uh, Gregory was too young, he was three. So at the school, they wouldn't take you, uh, um, under five, they wouldn't take you, because they figured you just run around the class, you wouldn't have the discipline. But I used to come home and teach Gregory all these steps. See, and even, even till the day he made his transition, Gregory could just look at a step, not even do it, look at it and do it. It was a gift, there was no doubt about it. And so one day, we're, well, I'm in class, tapping away, and Gregory, as always, snuck away from mother, and he was, got into class, and the teacher turned around and there Gregory was doing the steps. He said, he's how old is he? And I said, well, my brother's only three, and you don't want people, you know, you say you can't take us under five. And he said, no, bring him in the class. And that's really how we started. And, and, and we loved it so much, we loved it. And then, then when we met Henry Letang, who was the one who saw us, saw the, saw the potential in what we had to do, because he was friends with the great Nicholas brothers, and he saw us as, we never were as great as the Nicholas brothers, don't get me wrong, but, but yeah, he saw something in us. And then, and then we got, then we did the Apollo with Dinah Washington. And that was sort of, you all know who Dinah Washington is? Yeah. That's, she was a great, she was a great singer. Evil woman, but a great singer. <laughs> <laughs> she loved us, she wasn't, she wasn't evil to us, but she was evil to everybody else. <laughs> I haven't told that story in a long time. <laughs> so, but, so we did the Apollo with her, and that's really how it started, at the, at the Apollo, when we first did our first act. And how old were you when you first played the Apollo? Seven and five. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But I have to admit, you know, Henry, <laughs> Henry was so funny. He gave us adult steps, though. He didn't, he didn't want us to get o o over just because of the way we looked. He said, because uh, uh, I gotta tell you, we were cute. Nah, we were cute. No, we were really cute. And so, but Henry said, no, I don't want they got, they got to do three numbers. That cuteness will go so far that they got to really dance. So we were doing adult steps at a very early age, which got us, everybody came to see us because we were doing splits and leaps and jumps and pullbacks and stuff, stuff that kids didn't do at that age. And so we got jobs right away. The next job we got, it was 1955, was to work in Las Vegas at a hotel called the Moulin Rouge, which was the very first integrated hotel in Las Vegas. And it was in the, in the African-American side of town. 
That was that, it wasn't on the strip. Everybody knows where the strip was. But we weren't allowed, black people were not, were not allowed to even go on the strip. So this gentleman opened this fabulous nightclub called the Mullerys. It was a great, big nightclub. And, and everybody came, we were doing three shows a night. And every, all the big stars came to see our third show because on the strip they were only doing two. So we met Marlena Dietrich, who came to see the show. And then one night, Tallulah Bankhead. I don't know if you know who she is. She was a great actress in her time. She came to see us. And she said, oh, I fell in love with those little boys, those little boys. Bring them to my show at the Sands. Now, my mother knew we weren't allowed to be in that part of town, but she figured it's Tula Bankhead, you know, what they're going to say. She's a star. So we go over there, and she says, she says, I'll tell you what, you're going to come in the afternoon, and we'll spend the whole day, uh, we'll have lunch, we'll go swimming in the pool, and we'll just have a good old time. Because Tallulah was out there, baby. She was crazy. So now we're down by the pool. Now mother's nervous. She, now I tell this in my show, but it's a true story. She was nervous. Gregory and I are swimming in the pool. We just having a good, good old time. Now we don't notice people are getting out the pool, see? Now we, we don't notice this. My mother's noticing it, but we're kids. You know, we're having fun. And Tallulah's in the pool. She's screaming, oh, okay. She talked real down, down like that. Okay, let's swim. Let's go play with the ball. Let's, you know, like that. So all of a sudden, the lifeguard comes over, two little gets out the water, Gregory and I are still in the water. He said, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Miss Bankhead, um, uh, they cannot swim in the pool. They, uh, the black people, they can't be in the water. So Tallulah said, what are you talking about they can't be in the water? There's the pool, they're kids, they're swimming. They ain't gonna be in the water. She said, well, I'll tell you what. If they have to get out the water, then I'm not going doing the show tonight. I'm not going on tonight. And of course the hotel went, so of course we stayed in the pool. <laughs> It's a true story, Tallulah Bankhead, true story. And then from there, then we, we, we went back home and did the I'll but finish that story because it's a heartbreaker. <laughs> what? About what they did when you got out of the pool. Oh, but has such a good memory. He's such a good memory. This is true. But of course, at that time, we didn't know. When we, now, and so we, we stayed in the pool, called Tallulah said, stay in the pool. And then when we got out the pool, they drained the water. True story. Now, Gregory and I were so young, we didn't know. We figured they drained the pool because it was dirty or whatever, you know, and they needed to put new chlorine in the water. We know, my, mother just, my mother said, that, well, they need to put chlorine. She was so worried that our feelings get hurt, you know, because we were little babies. We didn't know about all that stuff. We just knew play in the pool, you know. So, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, well, she was heartbroken by that, my mother. She really was. But and Tallulah was furious, of course. But, uh, but we still, we had, we had a good time with her. And, and we were so young, you know, young and loving the business. And it was a great time. And when I think back, you know, my brother has made his transition and he's looking down on me now and I miss him terribly. But those were times that I love to remember because we were so young and, and, and loved the business. And we met, we met all these great stars. We met Maurice Chevalier was there. We met these great stars, Harry Belafonte. And he was just as fine then as he is now. He's just fine, you know, and a great, great person great person. And we got to know, though, of course, we met Sammy Davis Jr. We, a lot of people we met. There was a good time in Las Vegas at that time. And then when, when, they, when, the, when the, the, um, the segregation was over, then we worked the Riviera Hotel, and we worked with Gypsy Rose Lee. And, and, and we were not, my, my mother wouldn't allow us to see her do her strip. <laughs> see, you can't do, because our number was like in the first part of the show, and of course she was at the end, she, she was like the MC and introduced everybody, but then at the end she did her bit, which was called stripping, you know, in those days. And so one day, my mother couldn't find us, because we, we were in the curtains, <laughs> in the corner, watching Gypsy Rose Lee take them clothes off. <laughs> but she never took everything off. She just, you know, had a little chiffon blouse, but she was so funny, that was really her talent. She was very funny. And then and that, the Riviera was wonderful, and then we did the Dunes Hotel. Vegas was a good time for us, and we were learning. You know, we were learning our craft and being around great people who wanted to teach us because we, were, we really wanted to learn. It was a wonderful time, wonderful So time. You, you were the last of a dying breed. I mean, the people that you have worked with and performed with are the most famous names in the entertainment industry. Who was the most fun to work with? Oh, oh you ask great questions. I think probably the most fun that we had, and not so much uh, backstage, because we only worked uh, Hartford with a, for two shows, and, but it was on stage that we had fun, was Judy Garland. She really, this was in Hartford, Connecticut. 
And, but the story I tell in the show, which, which is true, we, uh, we, they, we were gonna do our part of the show. We were working at the Americana in the nightclub there. And they, uh, they came to us and they said, well, you're gonna work with Miss Judy Garland. We couldn't believe it. And they said, Judy Garland. Oh, Gregory and I said, well, who, who, who? The Judy Garland, that's right, the Judy Garland in Hartford. So, he's, I, so he, uh, her choreographer came. He said, you'll do your part of the show, then you're gonna do a number with Miss Garland, a soft shoe. We were over the moon. Oh, we were gonna dance with Judy Garland. But so at the end of the teaching of, of the soft shoe, we said, well, are we gonna dance with Miss Garland? You know, cause it's two of us for spacing and everything. We don't wanna, you know, be in her way. He said, no, Miss Garland, don't rehearse. <laughs> okay, we, we got nothing to say about that. Now. So now we go up to Hartford. We rehearse our part of the show with the big orchestra. Now we figure we're gonna rehearse with Miss Garland now cause she got to come to rehearse herself. No Miss Garland, her conductor comes and goes. So I said, well, when are we gonna rehearse with Miss Garland? He said, you're not rehearsing with Miss Garland. I said, well, we're still doing the number? Yes. So, okay, we ain't, we ain't seen her yet. We ain't seen her. We do off part of the show, intermission. And Miss Garland comes on from this side of the stage. We, we leave, she does the first part of her show. She leaves, goes over there. We start the number from over here. We still ain't met her. Now we got to sing and dance with her. See, we do the first part of the number across the stage, and then she jumps on. She goes, and she goes, hi, I'm Judy Garland. <laughs> so I said, hi, Miss Garland, I'm Maurice, this is Gregory. She said, you ready to do the number? I said, are you ready to do the number? <laughs> and she said, and she, of course she was, because she was Judy Garland. And we did the number with her, and I remember at the end of the number, see certain stars, there's a reason why they're stars. Not just the talent, there's a lot of talented people, but there's that special thing. And there's, we've, uh, we've been very lucky to work with a lot of them, and they all had that special thing. And at the end of the number, she took our hand to bow with us, right, the number. And Gregory said to me afterwards, did you feel her, the palm of her hand? I said, yeah there was like heat there, like right in the, in the palm, in the center. That's that electricity that those stars have. They will never see their like again. We'll never see that again. We'll see talented people. But to see that, and of course, Sammy Davis Jr. that we work with and Eleanor, they were special. They, they were, God said, poof, we're giving you this. We're giving you this. And Judy was so nice, and we did two shows with her. So the second show, she stood in the wings and watched us perform because she wasn't there the first show. And, we're, and she's going, go get them, guys, go get them. You know, Gregory and I, look, we forgot the audience was there. We started dancing for Judy. Because <laughs> she was saying, go get them, do that step, you know. That's the, that's the camaraderie of those great, great stars then. There's, there's a reason why they say they don't make them like that anymore, because they don't. They don't. I'm in this business, still in the business. I'm meeting a lot of the stars today. There was a warmth and a, and a camaraderie not, not all of them today, but most of them today is very selfish. It's not, you know, they don't give back as easily because they're afraid you're gonna take their job. But when, when who, Judy Garland and Lena Horn, who's, who Greg and I knew and who I know very well and knew very well, and, and Sammy Davis, they weren't afraid you'd take their job, baby. Oh no, who's gonna take Ella Fitzgerald's job? Nobody, <laughs> or Lena Horn or Sammy Davis, you know, or, the, or, the, or those great stars. So, so we were very lucky. I was very, very lucky and very grateful to have met them because they really, really liked Gregory and I. They really liked us. We were, well, it's hard not to. Yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a, they, were, they were very giving people. I mean, Sammy Davis, I mean, he was wonderful to us, Sammy Davis Jr. We, we did a show with him in Washington, and he said, little, hot, little Heinz boys, come on in, let me give you, let me give you a step because he was a great tap. Sammy was a great tap dancer, not a good one, a great one. A great one, and he'd give us steps of Gregory. I would learn it, you know, with, on the stage with Sammy Davis Jr., the greatest we ever saw. It's the greatest we ever saw. Could do everything, everything. The man could do, twirl guns, do impressions, sing, dance. I remember when we, we went to see him at the Apollo, and he sat down on the edge of the stage. At the Apollo, baby, rough. The Apollo was rough. You better keep dancing, you better keep singing, because they'll, they'll boo you off that stage. Sammy just sat on the edge of the stage and just with a cup of tea, and just talk to the audience at the Apollo. Greg and I never got over that, that he could do that. And they were riveted. They were riveted. Oh, fabulous, fabulous people. So I'm gonna be a little self-serving um, and ask you about Ella Fitzgerald because we are 
Maurice conceived of and uh, hired a writer to write uh, a musical about the life of Ella Fitzgerald, which we are going to be doing at Delaware Theatre Company this spring, uh, starring Frida Payne as Ella Fitzgerald. So tell us a little bit about Ella and why you were so interested in developing a musical about her life. Well, th this, th I, I haven't told this story. I haven't even told you this story. I forgot it until you just mentioned it now. We were, we were scheduled to go to the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas uh, to open for Don Rickles, comedian. You all know who Don Rickles is, comedian, right? So we had worked with Don at the Westbury Music Fair and we did really well. We, we did the first half of the show and of course Don was the star of the show, but Gregory and I got a standing ovation for our act. And my brother was very funny and comedians hate to hear laughter until they come on. They just hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and Don was, Don was really crazy, I like that. So, so he was go, we were gonna go with him to, Sa to Sarah because they were doing a, 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 a two uh, 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 show thing, uh, that kind of thing, and he canceled us. He canceled, he said, no, I don't want him. And we were very upset because my mother and father owed American Express $6,000, so we needed that job. And, we, and my mother was, she cried, and, 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 but then somebody, the agency, Joe Glazer at ABC who handled us, he knew Ella, and he knew Ella was going into the Flamingo. And he said, Ella, I want you to take these, this act. They're wonderful kids with their father, called Heinz, Heinz and Dad, and they were supposed to go with Don Rickles, and he canceled them out. She said, he did? He did, he canceled, why did he cancel? He said, well, you know, they were really good at Westbury, and they got a standard. She said, oh, he don't want them? I'll take them, just like that. And we never forgot that because she was that big, she was that big a star that the owners of the hotel would do what she wanted because she was making the money for them. And she wanted us there. And we worked with her twice there. One of the great ladies, one of the nicest women in the world. In fact, she was so nice. She was so cute, Ella. Just cute, you know, that cute thing. Cute. <laughs> and I remember she, uh, one night, oh, I gotta tell you, oh. Every, oh, I gotta tell you this. Every, every star came to see Ella Fitzgerald. Every star. I mean, it was star, you can't believe it. She, she just drew everybody. So one night, I would, oh, I would always stay the second show just to catch the first part of her show, and then of course we had open, and then I would go upstairs. So I'm, go, I'm coming backstage after, she's still on the stage, right? And all of a sudden I see this person, there's a person standing there, sitting in the chair, with a woman next to him in a suit, and he says, he still stands up, he looks at me, wonderful show, wonderful show. And he comes over to me and I said, excuse me, but do you know that you're Cary Grant? <laughs> it was Cary Grant. <laughs> Cary Grant, and he looked just like Cary Grant. Gorgeous, oh my God. And this fabulous suit, he had his suits made in New York, I knew, and on Madison Avenue. Jay looked fabulous, with, with, with a little tan with the white hair. And so Ella comes off, right? And I'm standing, he's talking to me, shaking my head, I, I couldn't believe it. And Ella, he sees Ella, and they kiss on the lips and everything, and I'm saying, my goodness, I'm standing here with two of the giants of the world, Cary Grant and Ella Fitzgerald, I was, I was in heaven. And Gregory had gone home, he was so upset with me. He said, you saw Cary Grant? I said, yeah, baby, he looked handsome, oh my God. Movie star, that movie star thing, we don't have that, too. there's a few today, but not like Cary Grant, not like those stars. So that was a wonderful time with us because everybody, everybody came to see her. It, and she was, she was so sweet. I said to Ella one day, oh, oh, one night my father introduced Joe Williams and Count Basie. We're in the audience, right? And we're not supposed to do that. We're the opening act. I don't care how good we are or whatever. That's done. That's for the star to do. But Daddy knew them personally. He played golf. And he knew he was wrong. So I went to the dressing room. I said, I'll, I'm going to apologize to Ella. I said, Ella, I'm so sorry. Daddy was so wrong to do that. I mean, these are your friends. I, but he plays it. She said, no, no. It's just that, you know, when there are other singers in the house, I get nervous. I'm not going to do good. I said, don't you know who you are? <laughs> You're Ella Fitzgerald. They're coming to pay homage to you, girl. She said, I know, but I'll make a mistake, and they'll laugh at me. You know, that's, that's the humbleness of those greats that we saw that I don't see too much anymore. I don't see that too much anymore. I think everybody thinks they're so fabulous. You know, Ella Fitzgerald th thought she had more to learn. She said, I still got more to learn, baby. I still got to learn how to do this. 
I said, yeah, right. If you, if you got more to learn, I really don't know nothing. <laughs> so when did your father join the act? Oh, he joined it. Uh, uh, we, were, we, were, we had just come back from Paris. We had worked in Paris with a wonderful team, uh, Roger Pierre and Jean-Marc Thibault, who, who, who were like G. Martin and Jerry Lewis at the Olympia Theater. They were wonderful stars. And my mother was very lonely without my father. We had been traveling a great deal, and we stayed in Paris a long time, but she was lonely. So all of a sudden, they, they, they really didn't know Gregory and I could sing. And we, we would sing around the house like kids. And all of a sudden, we, we, Daddy said, well, my mother said, why don't you join the act, sweetheart? You play the drums. Daddy was a drummer. And we'll try to get something going. You know, we, I, we, we, I don't think we would call Heinz Heinz and Dan yet. I think we didn't do that until we got to, to Hollywood, that we changed the name. And then, but that's how that, uh, Daddy joined that way. And then we put a little act together, and then we met our manager, Stanley Kay, who really put the, the big act for us. How, how old were you and Gregory? Oh, wow. I think we were... Huh. We were about 17, no, no, we were about 15 and 17. Wow. Around that time. So yeah. how did you train during all of that with all the performing? I mean, did you continue to take lessons, to study? How did you? That's a great question. You ask great questions. Usually people ask me the same questions, and I'm not buds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we, we, cause we were, well, Henry Latang was our, was our great teacher. And then when he gave us the act, which was three numbers, opening act, soft shoe, and then the big act where we did flips and you know the, the challenge dance. And uh, yeah, that, that, yeah that, that was when we were, were traveling great day. That's when we worked with Count Basie in Chicago and started meeting the big stars because they always had to have an opening act for them and we were the opening act. So then we met these stars and worked with them. And then when we started singing, then, then that was different. Yeah, that was, then, then we did, we did Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson was really, he made us stars. There's no doubt about it. He, he had us on the show t t about the last five years he was in New York, he had us on the show 25 times. He made us, there's no doubt about it. Uh, after we did that, he'd have us on every other week. Us and Diane Carroll, so that was the other one. Every other week he'd have us on. Of course, then they see you on TV and then the bookers book you and the audience know you. And that's what, so we owe everything, and we always, we, every time we saw him, and we didn't see him a lot, we'd always thank him. And in fact, the two people that he made took from nothing, really from nothing, were us in the business, us and Bette Midler. Oh. Yeah, she said that on the show. When he was leaving the show, she said that, because she was working the Continental Baths at that time, and she was trying to get something, and he brought her on there, but nobody would hire her because she worked at this gay bathhouse. And she, it wasn't, she didn't do anything gay, she was singing in the, the, the nightclub there. But nobody would take her. And Johnny said, yeah, I'll take her. What's that got to do with it? Can she sing? She can sing, sing a song. And she always said Johnny was one, and Johnny made us. And he made Diane Carroll too, because right after she, Diane Carroll uh, did his show a lot, she got Julia, which was the very, one of the first uh, African-American stars to have her own show. So Johnny, Johnny was one of the great people of show business, and a powerful, powerful. And when he said it, you did it, they did it, NBC did it. They didn't question, they didn't say, well, why do you want these guys on a lot? Johnny wants them, they go on. That kind of power doesn't exist anymore. Maybe Oprah, Oprah has got that. <laughs> Oprah's got that, yeah. So Gregory ended up moving to California, moving to Hollywood and starting to do a number of films. Yes. And that, I, did that break up the act? Well, it did. You know, uh, at the end, we, we, Gregory wanted to discover more, and, and so did I, because I wanted to get more into choreography, which I, which I did do, of course, and still am. Uh, but Gregory wanted to try his hand. He, he's tired of the act. We had worked with Bill Cosby at the um, uh, Lake Tahoe. That was the, kind of the last job. Oh, no, actually, uh, no, yeah, that was the last one, because right before that, we worked with Danny Thomas, who's a great man, great man. Oh, Danny Thomas. You all remember Danny Thomas? Oh, what a great man. Just, you know, you meet those people, and they just. You're such a name dropper, Maurice. I know. <laughs> I can't help it. I haven't talked about Danny Thomas in a while because I, I, we met his, I met his daughter Marlo at a, at a function and she, she remembered. She said, my father loved you guys. You know, sweet. She's a sweet lady, Marlo, and very talented. And uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, then we, then we, then we moved, Gregory, we broke up there because my, my father wouldn't stop traveling and he, was, he didn't want to travel anymore and, and go on the road and stuff. And Gregory said, I want to try my end in Hollywood. So we, we, we did break up. 
And it was, it was lonely for me because I missed my brother. I was very, Gregory wanted to try his hand as acting. Of course, he did wonderfully well. He did wonderful movies. And, uh, and then at the end, uh, w way before he got ill, uh, Hollywood, I was, t I was telling some, some young students in Pittsburgh, I did a big thing there for university there and for talent and uh, theater, the theater program. I want to let them know Hollywood is not what you think it is. Gregory had great success. He had the history of the world. He did, he did uh, wonderful movies. I mean, he really did. And at the end of his life, he couldn't get a job in Hollywood. They wouldn't hire him. And it hurt me because he was so talented. It hurt me. It really did. It hurt me because somebody, the, the person that, that um, you, you, he gets me to tell more stuff. I, I, and I, and I, I hate this that it happened, but it did. It's the truth. And Gregory was going to do more, more better blues with Denzel Washington, and Denzel got him fired from the movie. Denzel is not nice, and, and I, I tell Denzel to his face, you're not nice. You know, Gregory was good. He got insecure with Gregory because Gregory looked, Gregory was so beautiful. Oh, my God, so beautiful. Beautiful. And the camera loved him, and he looked good in the suits, and he was thin, and Denzel was heavy, and he got insecure. Actors are very insecure about their looks, and uh, Denzel certainly is one of them. I always tell the truth, so excuse me if, uh, if I do. But he hurt my brother, and I didn't like it. And, so, and then Gregory did a few other movies, but, but it's, uh, he, it didn't have to happen. Then he had a television series, which was wonderful. He was cute on that. And, but then he got tired of the business. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to do it anymore. He didn't want to do it. He wanted to settle down in Seattle, and he was so talented. Oh, he did that, he did that a song with Luther Vandross. Oh, my God. He said, whoa, right, baby? <laughs> Yes, sang with Luther Vandross. They sang that Luther was so cute with him. He said, your brother is so cute. I said, yeah, he's adorable. Isn't he, Luther? <laughs> and he sang so well. Gregory had so wonderful voice. Because Gregory had a voice, he had a top very similar to Johnny Mathis. Johnny Mathis has, has this round top, which is very difficult to do. You, usually you have to go into your head voice and sort of flattens out. But Johnny Mathis, <laughs> up there, baby. And Gregory had that. He had that. We were both very different. My style of singing is is very, very Nat Cole-ish, because Nat King Cole was my idol. So I, I sing very much like that. It's all about the lyrics. And I, had, I have a cute top. It's not quite as, as high as I would like, especially now that I'm older. It's, it's lowered a little. But uh, uh, Gregory had a beautiful round tone. Just a, as you can tell, I just adore my brother, as you can tell. Well, I think you adore your entire family. And what I, I do. know about you is family is the most important thing to you, oh, and yeah. your mother in particular. Oh. Tell us about your mom. I just love him. <laughs> he knows just how to lead me, you know? Well, my mother, without my mother, none of this would have happened, not just biologically. She was the one. She saw, because my father didn't see it. No, he didn't see it. What, we were tapping, but she said, she, she, he said something, I'll never forget it. We had an apartment in Brooklyn, and we were around the table, and she said, you know, I think it's time for them, they sing a little, I think it's time for them to join you. He had a singer with him, Johnny Brown, and he had a trio. I said, your sons need to join you, they can do this, they can do this. So he happened to say, I'll never forget it, because Gregory and I were in the room, we heard him. He said, I don't know if they could hold the stage alone. My mother said, excuse me, as only mothers can say it. You're telling me Maurice and Gregory cannot hold the stage, they've been holding the stage alone as tappers, all they're gonna do is sing. Add singing to the tapping. If they could hold the tapping, they could hold the singing. So this is your choice to make, which is no choice at all. <laughs> Put them in the act. And of course, it went through the roof. Mothers know. They know their stuff. They do. They just, they just know it. I'm not saying that fathers don't know stuff, but fathers sometimes have to, have to be convinced. <laughs> all the, lady, the ladies in the audience go, oh, that's right, that's right. That's right. So they have to be, which is fine, because once we scored, and then we put Danny up front with us, see, before that he was just playing the drums. So uh, our manager said, we need to put your father, bring your father up front. So we did a song called, Papa, won't you dance with me? Please dance with me. Oh, dance with me. It was a song from High Button Shoes, I think. And then we teach him the rock and roll dance, and the audience just loved it, because Danny was cute. He was a cute man. Big man, but cute. And, uh, uh, and that's really how that evolved. That's really how it evolved. Uh, my mother, uh, you know, when I think when I think about her, I've been thinking about. It, I've been very lonely lately, without my mother, father, and brother. I'm very lonely. Uh, I miss them because at this time in my life, we've been sharing so much. And my mother was so supportive. You know, when I would hit hard times and couldn't get a job, she said, "You get a job, baby, because you're talented. 
You just keep at it. Don't give up. You can't get nothing get given up. And you're talented. Somebody's going to see it. Because we were about to have, we were separated. And Gregory was having a problem at that time. She's like, my son's a talent. Is somebody going to see it? And sure enough, they did. And then Gregory did Sophisticated Ladies. And then I did Sophisticated Ladies. And then, uh, and then Gregory did the movies. And then I started choreographing. I choreographed a ballet uh, for a ballet company going to Connecticut. In fact, I'm going to China. I'm choreographing a, a huge dance extravaganza for China, which I'm very excited about. So my mother was right. She said, find your niche. Find what you love. Don't do what everybody else you love. You don't love movies, Maurice? You love theater? Then go to theater. Because I didn't love movies. I did one movie called The Cotton Club with, uh, for Francis Ford Coppola. Great man. Great man. Fabulous. Great winemaker. Great winemaker. <laughs> I'm going to tell him you said that. <laughs> he loved that. And uh, we did that movie for him, and he was just, what can I say about him? He's just, he's one of the greats. One of the greats. I just saw him because they played the Cotton Club movie at the Telluride Film Festival in Colorado, and it was a huge success. They, they, had, it, they had it in a hockey rink, and they turned away 200 people, and he was so proud. You know, he's just, I said, Francis, you're just so proud of this. He said, I am. He said, we did good work. He said, I'm proud of you and your brother acting like that. And, and, and uh, in fact, uh, it, was, it was a little difficult for him because they wanted to, to cut us out. We were, we were, they, they told Francis, these two guys, they've never acted before, really. Gregory had, of course, but Maurice had. And then I had to see why I looked. Make look, I was crying and stuff, and I could do it in one take because I was from the theater. You do it in one time. You don't tell the audience, "Wait, I'll do it for you next tomorrow." <laughs> audience wants it right now. So I did everything in one take, which Francis loved. All directors love that. So um, uh, uh, the the people who were distributing the movie, this is a true story. He told this story at the television. I didn't know it. He told this. Story. They went to him and said, "Listen, you know the the, the two boys, the two Heinz brothers, they're stealing the movie from Richard Gere." who was a nice guy, he wasn't Richard. And he said, well, so Francis said, yeah, and well, what do you want me to do? He said, well, can't you cut them out of the movie a little? Literally, true. Francis said, I'm not cutting them out of the movie. How about cut them out of the movie? They got big parts of the movie. They're singing, they're dancing, they're acting. They're, Maurice has got to see where he cries. You want them, so you want me to cut them out of the movie because they're stealing the movie from Richard Gere, who you paid a million dollars to. And I always tell this story to Richard. I said, every time I see Richard, I said, Richard, you know, I remember that the weather. He said, yeah, Richard didn't want it either. He said, well, you gonna cut them out the movie. That's ridiculous. And he, he, he backed Francis. He said, I'm the star of this movie. You're not cutting them out the movie. No, you're not doing that. No. So I said, well, Richard, I'm so glad you, you did that because, you know, I remember what you were getting for the movie and what I was getting. So I needed that to be in this movie because I was making $1.98. All right, I'm going to ask one last question, and then we're going to open it up. But oh, um, So here you are. You're going to turn 75 this year. You're fitter than most men half your age. <laughs> um, what's a day in the life of Maureen, Maurice Hines like these days? You know what I do? I, well, I get up very early, uh, and I make my calls because I'm, I'm doing different things. I'm certainly for Bud, uh, t um, the LF Project, and hopefully one day I'll bring Tapping Through Life back, which I want to do. I, I just adore the theater, the Delaware Theater Company, and the theater itself. I like working at certain theaters are, are, are good, and, but that theater is fabulous. They're right on top of you. It's wonderful. Uh, and then um, uh, I may be doing a television series with Debbie Allen. She's a good friend of mine. I don't know if you know who Debbie Allen is. She's a wonderful, wonderful star. We had done Guys and Dolls together many years. I, years ago, I played Nathan Detroit, and she was Adelaide. We were outrageous, baby, because we're both dancers, so it was a very physical uh, um, physical way we did the, the show. And so they want us to do a uh, Shonda Rhimes, who's very famous for Grey's Anatomy and Scandal and those shows. She wants to do a, a, a scripted dance series for Netflix. So I was in California, Debbie said, uh, Shonda wants you to do the show with me and, and play this particular character. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it, of course. You know, uh, Shonda Rhimes is class and Netflix is uh, a wonderful organization. So we'll do that. Uh, and then, of course, the China thing, and then uh, Ella. So I'm very, I'm very blessed that the work is coming. It's very difficult these days to get the kind of work that I want to do. You know, it, uh, I, I, I'm not a rock singer. I'm not a rhythm and blues singer. I'm a theater singer. And so it, uh, theater is very, very rough. And it's very rough for African Americans to get shows on Broadway. Just that's the reality of it. I speak to my agent about it all the time. It's very hard. They wanted to do Sophisticated Ladies again. Of which I would, which I would have done, and, and that I would have represented my brother and myself, uh, which would have been really 
an honor because my brother was just spectacular. My brother was spectacular. When I think about it, you know what I mean? Not only was he beautiful to look at, but he was so talented. He was, he was an improvisationalist in tap. He could just do it. You know, people that could just do it. I could do it, but not, you know, I need to be, I need to choreograph it. But Gregory could just dance. His bone was just there. You know, in fact, we taught each other. Because Gregory would, well, oh, this, this is a cute story. When we were little, Gregory would always, we would learn the steps. We would learn it, Gregory would learn it quick. And it would take me a while to learn it, and he would teach me the steps. Because it took me a little while. The next day, Gregory had forgotten all the steps. So I would teach him because I remembered it. And that's how we really helped each other. Because people always used to say, well, brothers were jealous of each other. We were never that. We were never that. We adored each other. We would have our brother fights, like all brothers, but we adored the ground each of us walked on when we saw each other. We just, people would go crazy when they saw us. Because first of all, you know, we would, we would. And your mother wouldn't have it any other way. No, she wouldn't, baby. No, she wouldn't. Great lady. The greatest, greatest lady in my life was my mother. I know a lot of great ladies, but she was. And, and no matter what it was, you could come to, I don't care what problem it was, you think, to, oh, they're going to get mad at me. Uh-uh. What is it, baby? Sit down and tell mother. What is it? We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We, I'm, uh, I can't get a job. We'll figure it out. Greg, we couldn't get a job in Hollywood. He was living on the street. Yeah, I'm flying out there. She flew out there. I'm going to get you the place. Here, yeah, you're going to do this. Just a fabulous woman. I miss her to this day. I'm lost without her, actually. I really am. I just... When good things happen, I would always call her, Mother, I got, got this job! You know, I have all her pictures around when she was a young girl, and I say, so now I, if, I, if, I, if I get a job, or if I, when I saw Francis, I said, Francis, I said, Mother, I saw Francis Coppola. And she said, well, you, well, did you behave? My mother, would always, my mother would always say, behave yourself and watch your nasty mouth. Because <laughs> we were very, Gregory and I were very aggressive. Oh, my God. What, be class. I want my son's a class now. Watch your mouth. I said, okay, mother. <laughs> Daddy didn't have to say too much because he was, he was a bouncer. My father was the bouncer at the Audubon Ballroom where Malcolm X was assassinated. He was, my father was a street guy. He was not, oh, baby. We did not play with Daddy. He just had to look at us and we behaved because he was that kind of man. He didn't have to say too much, except my mother could handle him, my, you know, women. She could she calm him right down. <laughs> All right, Adelaide, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll open it up for okay. questions. Um, for any of the students that are out here, what advice would you give students here at Cab Calloway if they want to pursue the performing arts? Never give up. Never. And there, there are people who will, and always believe in yourself. I, I, I can't say it enough because there were times when people t told me and Gregory, somebody, somebody near, the, near when Gregory was doing movies, somebody told, told him, Gregory, you know, you're not good at movies, you're not that good. Gregory said, really? Ah, well, I think I am. I think I am. And people would say, Maurice, you, you want to be a choreographer? No, oh, that's me. You're, you're a tap dancer. They didn't know I had taken ballet and jazz and all that before, but they, were, they limit you. The one thing Oh, so who said this to me? It wasn't Ella, it was somebody else. Either, we worked with Carol Channing, too, who's a great, great star. Great, great woman, great woman. Never, people will try to limit you in this business, all the performers here. They will try to limit you. But as long as you don't limit yourself, you will succeed. Don't let anybody tell you something I can't do. You can't do, you can't do that. Oh, really, I can't do Somebody told me you can't direct. Oh, really, I can't? Yes, I can. That's why I like I love uh, Bud because Bud is like one of those guys who will nurture. He nurtures by his very presence. He nurtures. So, and I, I haven't directed in a while, and I know I'm going to go to him and say, "Bud, what do you think? What do you think the scene is working?" I know I'm going to do it because he's the director, and we help each other. No one does it alone. No dancer does it alone. They have a choreographer that gives them steps. Nobody, you know, we, we're, that's what the good, good thing about showbiz and, and the camaraderie of theater, because we all help. Movies is a different story. There's so much money involved, they, uh, no, they ain't helping you that much. No, they're just not. All the movie people I've met, I lived in Hollywood for 11 years. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I was, I was, I was, it, it was hurtful to watch it, to watch, because I was from the theater and I never, never lost that. And they would never tell you about a job. That's the other thing, you go to these parties, 
in, in broad in theater, they say, hey, man, there's an audition around the corner. You'd be right for it. Not in Hollywood, baby. Oh, no, no, no. They don't tell you about, about an audition for a movie because they're afraid you might get it and they won't. Where in theater, they, if I don't get it, I want, I want you to get it. You know, that's what's wonderful about the theater. I just, oh, I love that. I love it. I love that part. Well, shall we open it up for questions from the audience? I'd love to answer questions. I love answer questions. I think we have microphones oh, at the uh, end of each aisle. OK. I teach first grade, and I'm just dying to know, how did you go to school when you were doing all that performing? <laughs> oh, yeah. They, in those days, I don't know if they still have it. it they had, there were two schools, Professional Children's School and Quintanos. And they were set up because there were a lot of kids in a lot of shows. Um, uh, oh, oh, uh, who's the, oh, oh, I can't believe I've forgotten her name. I'm, I'm really upset about it because she was a good friend of mine. She was a good friend of mine. She did the Miracle Worker. Uh, Patty, Duke. Patty Duke, yes, and we went to the same school, uh, Quintanos, and when she was doing that, so they put you on correspondence, especially if you're on the road. If you're on, if you're on Broadway, then you can still go take class, except on Wednesday, which is matinee days. But on the road, you get correspondence, which Gregory and I did, and then you send it back in, so you kept your studies up there. They, yeah, that's a great question, yeah. I've forgotten that we did that, yeah. Mr. Hines, we're so glad you're here. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Tell us a little bit about the project of Ella and how that evolved. Ah, uh, well, I had done, I'd done it a while ago, and I was not really happy with it. So the writer, Lee Summers, and I, we got back to work, and it did star uh, Frida Payne then, too. Uh, I don't know if you know Frida Payne. She had a great hit record called Band of Gold, and, and Frida... Is a, is a remarkable, Frida was a jazz singer before she did Band of Gold, so she comes at it in, in that way. Uh, but she sings in Ella's key and sings Ella Scat exactly like her. It's a phenomenal feat to, to follow Ella Fitzgerald. I mean, I can't say enough about her. And, and she's just fabulous. So, and so I always wanted to, I, I, I remember I was very young, I went to see Ella after we had worked with her, we, she was at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, and we went as a family to support her, and of course it was packed to see her. And we went backstage, and I remember saying to her, I said, you know, Ella, one day they're gonna do a tribute to you and a show about you. I didn't say I was gonna do it, because in, in those days I wasn't thinking as a director. And she looked at me and she said, ah, I don't amount to too much, Maurice. They're not gonna do something about me. It was so sad in a way, because she was so monumental in our business. And uh, sure enough, I, when I got the chance, I said, I, and I, I looked up, I said, Ella, I told you that they're going to do something, it's going to be me. And I did it. And now, and this, this production, though, is the production that I wanted because I learned a great deal the first time. You learn. I learned on the job. So this production is going to be spectacular. It really is. I, I know it is because I feel it. The love for the fr Frida can't wait to sing it. She can't wait to do it. And the other people in the cast too, you know. It's, we see Norman Grands, who was a manager. Oh, it's going to be a wonderful production. And and uh, uh, Delaware Theatre Company, that's what they do. They do wonderful productions. I'd heard about them before I did my show Tapper Through Life because I heard people that were, were here and did it here. I knew about Bud long before I met him. They just said Maurice. Every now and then one comes along like him. I said really, really okay. So when I heard I was coming, I couldn't wait to be there. Of course, they were right. He is a spectacular person. He's just spectacular, yeah. Mr. Hines, thank you again for coming. Um, Hollywood is obviously going through an enormously important change with the Me Too um, yeah. uh, uh, explanation. And how do you see that changing Hollywood and the theater and Yes. movies for women and and for black yes. and all minority actors. Yes, yes, right. It needed to. When I was living out there, we heard about stuff like that. We really did. And and, and I was, I couldn't, I, you know, you heard about it back in the day, you know, when Marilyn Monroe was, was there, the casting couch and all that. But those guys, they were doing terrible stuff. I said, oh, people, I, that was one of the reasons why I left there. I said, I don't want to be around this. It's, 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 it's not right what they're doing. And, and, the, and the girls, you know, the way they treated the girls, the way they talked about the girls, I didn't like it. 
I told my brother, because he was out there too, I said, Greg, I got to get out of here. I don't like this. I don't like the way where they treat, and mostly women, mostly women and young girls. That's what got me. They were young. And I said, look, what they, look, look how they're talking. Look what they're trying to do to these girls. And so I'm glad they caught them. I'm glad they're doing this, because they need to, they need to clean sweep get, get them guys out there, because they were in power. It's power. That's what makes them do it. It's the power. The power of wanting them, and they know, and I don't think a lot of the young actors want to be famous. They just want to do good work. They want to do good work. A lot of them don't want to do theater. Theater's too hard, eight shows a week. Movies are easy. They really are. I mean, I, you do one scene, you're on to the next one, if you do it well, you know? If you have to cry, you know how you learn how to cry. It's a, but theater is the, is the training ground. I tell everybody, you want to do movies, go to theater first. That's, that's where you learn your craft, and then you can do it any way you want. But I'm, 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 in a way, I'm glad they, they caught all those guys. I'm glad they're going to they're gonna clean up Hollywood, and they are. I've got friends who are out there, the Simmeries. A lot of stuff they're doing, they're not getting in the paper, but they're cleaning up. They got to. They got to. So I'm, I'm glad they're doing that. I'm glad you asked that question. Maurice, do you see a shift to having a lot more women in, in power in Hollywood? Yeah, I think it's important. Uh, I, find, I found that when I was out there, I met, um, uh, oh, she's great. she was a great, great um, producer. I met all the, wi all the women in Hollywood that I met in positions of power only talked about the job. Every man I met out there talked about his Rolex watch. <laughs> I couldn't get over it after a while. They would say, I would sit down for lunch, you know, you meet the people, they go, how do you like this watch? <laughs> and I'd say, it's a nice watch, I don't have one. I'm here to get a job so I can get one of them. But the women always talked about the part. They went right to why you were there. They didn't waste any time. Dawn Steele, that's the famous one, Dawn Steele. Fabulous woman. I met her, I was up for a movie and I met her. And, and I got met with a lot of male producers and, and, and they would always talk about what they had, their cars. And I, went, I met Dawn Steele, who was very famous. She had done, she had done uh, that movie for Michael, that Fatal Attraction. That was that, that she, was the, she was the one that spearheaded that movie. She was a star before then, but that movie made a big baby because that made a lot of money. So money, it's so all about money in Hollywood, and that made a lot of money. And she, and, and she, I met with her about a, a, a part, and she said, "Okay, uh, um, uh, what do you know about this part? What, how do you feel? How do you see this part? How do you, right to where I was there, right to where I was there? I couldn't get over it. The difference between the women and the men. I think more women should be running Hollywood because I think, I, I think we'll see more diversity." That's what I think. We'll see more diversity uh, on the screen, also diversity in, in the offices, the power offices. Because in Hollywood, it's all about power. Got nothing to do with nothing else. I will say, um, I can't comment on Hollywood, but I can co certainly comment on the professional theater. And all of the uh, unions in the professional theater are highly focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And if there is a play about a woman, it should be written and directed by a woman. If there's a play about an African American, it should be written and directed by an African American and not, and I'm guilty of this because one of the most important plays we did last year was a play called White Guy on the Bus. And it was written by a white guy and directed by a white guy. And, um, and we got sort of admonished a little bit for that. And I understand why. Um, so I think there's a, there's a big movement in the theater, and the Lort Theaters, the League of Resident Theaters, of which Delaware Theater Company is a member, there's about 76 in the country. Um, we all have to sign commitments to the fact that we're going to pursue that. We have to have a sexual harassment policy that equity, Actors' Equity made us implement this year, and it gets delivered to everybody in the cast on the first day of rehearsal. Um, so I think the, the theater is taking it very seriously. Uh, Mr. Hines, I know you like to work with young dancers, but I wanted to ask what you do for yourself. Do you take class still? Uh, do you work every day? Do you dance for yourself? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. What I do, I do the treadmill three times a week, uh, 20 minutes, and do it almost, almost up to running. 
You tapple on the treadmill? No. <laughs> that was good. That was a good one. <laughs> no, I don't tap on the treadmill. I don't really tap uh, at all, you know, until I, until I do my show. Um, it's just come second nature to me now. I've been doing this so, so many years. But I do do my stretches. Uh, because of what I'm teaching, uh, uh, like a jazz hip hop for, the, for China, I'll do a lot of, I'll get in more, more in better condition than I am now. And I'll, I might take some classes, but I do a ballet bar. I do all the things that dancers have to do and, and stretch my body and keep that together as much as I can now at 75. But because but, uh, I'm not going to be in the show, I'll just put the, the choreography on the dancers. Uh, but that, yeah, I do that. I eat right. I don't, uh, don't drink every now and then a glass of wine, but I'm not uh, a drinker. I don't smoke at all anything. <laughs> I don't smoke anything, uh, so my lungs are clear, and I'm, I, I take good care of myself. I, you know, I just eat right. You know, eat one me I eat one meal a day. At three o'clock. <laughs> He's so funny. He's so funny. <laughs> three o'clock. That's right when I eat. I will say, and this is another commercial, but um, if you would like to see Maurice dance um, on. March 3rd, Delaware Theatre Company is doing its Play Apart Gala, and Maurice headlined it a couple of years ago, but this year we're actually bringing uh, cast members back from each of the musicals that we've done since I've been there, oh, wow. and Maurice and the Manzari brothers are going to perform that night as well. That's right. He said, we don't need music, we just need our tap shoes. All right. I'm going to tap my brains out that night. I really go. I'm, I'm, I'm so looking forward to it. A lot of people I know that uh, that have done shows here are going to be there, so it's going to be a lot of fun. You got to come. Got to come. We're going to have a ball on that stage. A ball. <laughs> it's very exciting to see you here tonight. Thank you so much. Of all the things that you've done in your life, the, the tapping, the the choreography, the the directing, which do you enjoy the most, and and which would you like to continue doing until you can't do it anymore? Choreography, choreography, there's no doubt about it. I didn't know I was gonna love it that much because I love being on stage. I love the audience. I love them. Like right, right now, I'm just in love with you all. It's a wonderful feeling to feel that about something that you love He means doing. it. I really do, I just, I just love looking at you. I'm looking at you like you're looking at me. You know, like this lovely lady here, the white turtleneck. She's adorable, how could you not love it? Come on, you know? And, they, and uh, I remember somebody told her, when you give all that love back, the audience will give it to you. Judy Garland, that's, 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 that's who said it. As I, we asked her, because we got a chance to talk with her um, in between the two shows. I said, what is it? She said, Maurice, when you give all the love to them, they give it back to you. They do. Accept it. Open yourself up to it. And coming from Judy Garland, because everybody loved her. They gave her that love, see? And she loved them. And that was, uh, we, Greg and I felt it, but when you hear it said like that, we got it. We got it. We really did. Nat King Cole also said it. We met him to it in Las Vegas. Talk about a classy man. Woo, baby. Class down. Unbelievable. Hi, Mr. Hines. Yeah. Um, as, as you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was taken away horribly at 37 or 38. And I was wondering if, if you ever had any, uh, if your paths had ever crossed, and what would you imagine the world would be like today if he was still with us? a great question. No, we never, we never, uh, our uh, paths never crossed, which was uh, a great thing. I met his son, Dexter, in Atlanta, and we had a wonderful talk. Uh, what can you say about him? The man was, uh, he was uh, a monumental figure in my life, in that I, 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 the effect that he had on me emotionally was, very interesting. It wasn't just watching or listening to him talk. Or it was just the effect. It was so, so good. He was such a good person. And I knew people who know him. I had spoken to Mr. Belafonte about him a lot, and I asked him, and he said, he basically said the same thing. I said, Mr. Harry, I got to know him well. I said, Harry, what was it about him? He said he was truly, completely a good person. You know, they try to put all these other things on him, you know, and he was certainly he was spiritual, but he was genuinely a good person. And, and, and that's what I felt. That's what I, I, the effect that he had on me. And I, and coming from Belafonte, I mean, he, who knew him very well, and uh, he affected you that way. 
and he wanted, oh, and he also wanted the best for people. He didn't, he didn't think in terms of white and black. He thought in terms of good people. We're all good people. We're all capable of being good. And it's not as difficult as it seems, you know, to be that open. Yeah. Got, got, got them, you know. yeah. Thank you again for being here, Mr. Hines. It's been wonderful. My question, you may have just answered it, I don't know, but you have such tremendous optimism, love for life. I was just wondering what grounds you or what you, what experiences made you who you are and brought you to that place? It's a great question. The, the only thing I can say about that, because I have had, like everybody else, hard times. I have, uh, there's no doubt about it. But when I go through them hard times, I think only of my mother because she had some hard times, and she came through them. She came through them, and she always, I always can think of her, and, and what would she do here, and how would she feel? I, I, I have, I have uh, when she made her transition, I have her ashes in a urn, and I talk to them, and, and, I, and I hear her talking to me <laughs> if I'm doing something wrong, <laughs> oh yes. And so I, I feel very comforted that way. I'm a very spiritual person. I go to St. Patrick's Church every Monday and Friday, and I commune with my family, and it, it grounds me, and, it, and I am optimistic. I'm in a business that is, and, I, and Bud knows this, and I, I'm honest about it because I know my business. I'm in a very difficult, sometimes hateful business. But as long as I'm optimistic and as long as I can come and be in a, with an audience of lovely people, it makes it all worthwhile. All the hard stuff that you go through, and I'm sitting here looking at you, and you're looking at me, it makes it all worthwhile. Because without you, without you, I'd be just in a rehearsal room, do, do the mirror. You do, I do it for you. And in, in doing it for you, you give me so much back. You make it all possible for me to be happy. You know, I have my personal life. I have a happy personal life. But I'm on the stage. That's what I did. That's what I did when five years old. So whenever I, whenever I feel down, I think about what the audience can give me. What the audience can. You have no idea the effect you have on me. You have no idea the effect you have on me right now. I'm just thrilled to be here and just... It makes me happy. I, I, I decided I made a choice. Happiness is a choice. I made a choice. I said, I'm going to, because I went through some hard times the last couple of years. I said, I made the choice to be happy. I'm not going to, don't, don't come with me. What's that song in the, in the Wiz? Don't bring me no bad news, baby. Don't bring me no bad news. We're in a difficult time now politically. I get it. I get it. But I'm going to be happy during this time. I'm going to be happy. You should hear Maurice's uh, voicemail message. He says, hi, this is Maurice. Leave me a message, but I don't want to hear nothing negative. If you can't leave me something positive, I don't want to hear from you. <laughs> it's, true. it's true. I had to put it on my machine. <laughs> you know, I wish, I wish that they, 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 uh, the, the stage, the stage, I wish I had, a, I had brought my tap shoes. Not bad. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> I don't run my time to tap it all night. <laughs> I hope you come to see the Ella Project because I, it's done with a lot of love and I'm so glad that I'm, I love doing it because I was personally involved with Ella, of course, and Free the Pain, but also because it's at the Delaware Theatre Company and I have such love for everybody there. We were working today on the set and talking about the set. and different. Everybody is there and they are so on top of their game. They're on top of their, they're on point. And I've and I'm, 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 I'm worked a long time. I know when people ain't on point now. When, they, when they're struggling, no, no. And, and not just Bud, all of them there. We have a wonderful costume designer coming in, Emilio Sosa, who just did Motown on Broadway. He can't wait to work. He said, I've always wanted to work. I want to work at the Delaware Theater Company. I mean, that's what, that's what he's done. People want to come here. That's, that, you have no idea. There are not a lot of places that people come there because they got to work and make, you know, pay their rent. But when they say, I want to come, there's a girl, Deborah Walton, is coming. She told me, Maurice, I can't wait to come there. Imagine that. 
That's a tribute to this man. That's a tribute. Thank you. It is. It, it you takes know? a village. <laughs> it's a tribute. Oh, my God. Anyway. Um, okay. Mr. Hines, uh, I think you're a very talented person and uh, a wonderful man. I enjoy your talk. Uh, could you tell us more about your China? I don't know. You're going to do shows there? Yeah. yeah. There, um, I'm going to do, uh, well, originally it was just going to go to one theater in, in Shanghai. But now, because once they saw me, uh, they came. Well, here's something interesting. The, the 22 of uh, the producers came uh, because the, the show's going to tour. So there, was, there were four guys, four guys, who were the money guys. They're the guys who, who produced the show. And all the rest were, were young girls, young girls. And so I, I met them all, and I said, well, are these all the secretaries? And they said, no. These young girls tell the men how to spend the money as it should be. <laughs> it's true. They were the power behind it. And it was fascinating to see that. Cause, uh, and I met them all, took pictures and everything. So it's, it's, I'm so excited about it I'm, because it's, it's, it's new for me and it's choreography is what I love doing. So I'm very excited. I, I, wanted, I almost went, Gregory went to, to uh, no, he went to, he went to Japan. I wanted to go to um, Shanghai a long time ago. There was a, a, something else that was happening there, but I, I, I missed the opportunity. But this time they're they are sending for me. So I'm going to go there and just, I'll just, just have a ball. You know, I, I, I have a good time in my life. I do. I just, I just have a ball and meeting other dancers and exchanging ideas, learning from them. Show me a step. You know, and then, and, oh, it's a great feeling. Great feeling. Anybody else? Are we good? Okay. Well, before I before you know, I have to thank you all. I have to thank you all for coming tonight. I, you know, I really appreciate it. It's what I love doing, giving back and meeting my, meeting my audiences and, and meeting the people that, that love theater and love shows. I'm honored to be here. I can hear my mother saying it. I can hear saying it. Did you, uh, uh, said she would all, I'd call her up afterwards. I said, she said, honey, did you have a good time? I said, yeah, mother, I had a good time. There were wonderful questions. There were lovely people. She said, that's good. I want, you, I want my son to have a good time, you know? And I said, she, uh, and she'd say, uh, she'd always say, uh, my son's my life. That's how she would, she would sign the cards. My son's my life. And I want to thank you for my mother, for my father, my brother, but mostly for my mother. Thank you for being so nice to me. Thank you so much.